Hello, everyone. We hear a lot about nanotechnology. It's become a buzzword in the last uh, few years, maybe about 15 years or so. The question is, where is nanotechnology? Do we see in our everyday life? Do we experience this? Do we have te this technology at our disposal? The answer is yes. This is something that has changed how we do everyday things, starting from waking up to an alarm clock. Uh, many times it's iPhone where we put like three clocks, three alarms, and our spouses don't like it. Or for students, they put on those gong sound on their iPads, making our coffees, switching on your TV, all the way to the time that we go to sleep and we have to check our Facebook feed once again. It's everywhere. And something that has made this to work is it took over about 40, 50 years. So the third industrial revolution, as we call it, microelectronics or electronics, especially integrated circuits, when we brought all those components, resistors, capacitors, inductors, and we put them on what we call silicon. So silicon-based electronics is everywhere. We used to have television sets where we had vacuum tube. Uh, many of uh, Millennium kids, they have no idea what I just said, but older folks would know that we had to turn those TV sets on and we had to wait for a few uh, minutes, maybe a couple of minutes before we could see the, the screen pop up. And that changed once we had the electronics uh, in the form of solid state electronics, which essentially uh, changed or revolutionized uh, our lives. And that has helped us develop systems, develop uh, the mediums where we can control things at nanoscale. And when I say nanoscale, I literally mean at atomic scale. Now we can control material, we can control material properties, we can handle material at nanoscale. An example is braille code. We all know what is braille code, those risen dots. If uh, you haven't ever seen a braille code, I would say next time when you are, you push button for an elevator, you'll see there'll be dots next to that number of the floor. That's basically braille. We feel braille with our bare fingers. But think if you live in north or in cold areas and we use mittens or gloves, if you try to feel those dots, we cannot feel it. So essentially, the point is that to work at nanoscale, we need to have tools and we need to have means to deal with those things at nanoscale. And now we have those things, which is what has brought nanotechnology in our everyday life. When I say in uh, every aspect of our life, here's an example. Uh, this looks like uh, people in developing countries, in, in developed world, uh, especially this, this picture is from Europe, from a, a friend of mine who showed at a conference. But this is not so different than any developing country as well. Where do we see nanotechnology? We may not uh, be able to comprehend, but essentially it is everywhere, starting from our cell phones, our computers, the frames of our, of our bikes. Again, older folks would know the bikes we used to ride, they were like a ton heavy. But now we have those bikes that we can lift just with one hand. The frames, the material of those bikes, the tires, even cosmetics, we have nanoparticles in, in sunblocks. It is already everywhere. Now, speaking of this picture and thinking about uh, uh, poor areas of the world, I, I, I remember I landed in Dhaka, Bangladesh, 
a few years ago, my first time, and I could see the cycle rickshaws. The, the, it's, a, it's a thing where people drive the, those things, and you, you sit at the back. They would have two cell numbers written on their, on their cycle rickshaws, which means they would have two cell phones, even the cycle rickshaws. So that nanotechnology is everywhere, all around the world, in slums, in uh, all segments of our economy. What does that mean? How does that help us if we talk about healthcare? How does that help us if we talk about different aspects of our body or specifically medicine? We can now interface living systems at smaller scales. And, and knowing that many of the diseases, especially cancer, which is the topic today as well, has its origin at genes, at mutations. So now we have developed tools or we have developed devices, nanopores, cantilevers, we have uh, nanowires, nanotubes, quantum dots, nanoparticles, so many things at that scale, which possibly we can interface the living things at that scale. Going back to that example of, of Braille and with bare fingers, now we have tools that we can do something about it. And of course, at larger scale, we have had so many ways of, of medical interventions, medical diagnostics and, and therapy at, at organ scale, at, at skeletal scale, but now, we need to do something about uh, our diseases which have their known roots at molecular scale. And that's where the technology, what we call nanotechnology or microelectronics can help us. And think about it. Think about the growth or the control that we have. Seven billion people or so on the face of this earth and seven billion components that uh, IBM made on a computer chip last year, which is one centimeter by one centimeter. So if we can make seven billion devices, we can really interface life at really small scale. And that is something which should give us motivation to do something about human mortality. Very interestingly, for last 50, 60 years, probably that's when we have started gathering data or at least started classifying the causes of death. Human mortality from cancer has not gone down. Think about it. We are still dying at the same rate, although now we have uh, known uh, toxic effects of so many things. We have so many regulations. We don't have leaded gas. Again, older folks would know we used to have all kind of emissions we would be sending out. Uh, despite all those, uh, uh, what do you call, the, be the betterment in the quality of life, we are still dying at the same rate, which essentially should motivate us that that there is something that drastically needs to change. And that's where nanotechnology or control at micro and nanoscale is, is helping us derive and come up with new ways. And there are many ways how we can do it. There's many ways how it's been already shown. We can separate out cells based on their electrical behavior, something called dielectrophoresis. We can use magnetic nanoparticles and coat them with certain antibodies which would specifically bind to cancer cells and separate them out magnetically. We can coat surfaces and capture tumor cells from a given body fluid which can be blood, urine, saliva, even uh, human tears which carry those known molecules which are indicated of, which are indicative of the, of the, of the what do you call health or a disease going on. We can look at the tumor cells and look at their mechanical properties by, by sucking in a single cell at a time in a, in a format of what we call uh, a capillary, capillary electrophoresis. So there are so many ways how it's been done and especially after Human Genome Project, we know now many of genes and proteins which are uh, known to be related to cancer, much like uh, 
we know cholesterol is related to heart disease. We know many of the, the proteins or molecules which are related to, to cancers. We do have some uh, tests, what you call screening tests for a few cancers, but there are so many other types of cancers which have no screening tools, which, which have no way of even finding whether a metastatic potential exists in a given tumor or that or not. So that's where uh, nanoscale approaches can help us. So I'll give you a couple of examples where we can capture tumor cells and those aggressive tumor cells show a very distinctive dancing behavior on a nanotextured device or a nanotextured substrate, which is different than what you would see for a non-metastatic tumor cell or, or, a, or just a regular cell from that organ. With, this is an approach which can help us objectively identify whether there are tumor cells in a, in a given sample, again, simple bodily fluids, or we can interrogate each individual cell at, at any given time, J much like uh, bouncers in a bar. If uh, you guys are young like me and try to get into a, a club, they would ask for ID. Although I have some white hair, but they would still ask for that, and I feel honored. They think I'm a young guy. So think about it, a bouncer interrogates and, and, and checks each individual person before he or she goes in. This is something we can implement for, for cells as well. So the idea is if you can create a small orifice, a micropore in a very thin membrane, a nanoscale membrane, 100 nanometer or 200 nanometer thin, and let cells flow through you can measure ionic current across that channel and see when a cell goes through in the form of a dip in the current. And that is essentially what would turn into a pulse, which would be a dip in the ionic current. And we can use those pulses to identify those cells based on their mechanical, physical, and chemical behavior. Those single pulses can tell us about not just whether a cell is normal, but even if that cell is metastatic or non-metastatic. So this is some data which uh, we have gathered where we can identify between those two types of cells. Why is that important? Think about a simple uh, tumor, breast cancer. We, we, we feel or we have been given to perceive that breast cancer is completely treatable, which is not the truth. M majority of, of breast can cancer patients die of recurrence because of metastasis, because there is no easy or direct way to look and differentiate between indolent cells and metastatic cells. So this might be a way where we can look at a given sample and define the strategy to deal with that type of cancer instead of giving same treatment to all patients, which is essentially over-diagnosis, over-treatment, where we might end up giving the same chemotherapy to a patient even though their disease is not metastatic in nature. But that's, again, a potential of nanotechnology in, in differentiating those cells or, or those uh, diseased behaviors at single cell level. And not just that, there's, there are other unknown questions, questions like micrometastasis, questions where we don't know the subpopulations within a tumor, where we might have many, many different types of cells of cancerous nature, but they exist all together in a given lump, but we don't have a direct way of knowing each one of those. If we can develop technologies further and narrow down and find and cloud them based on their behavior, we might be able to treat each individual patient based on their signatures, which is the concept behind what we call 
personalized, personalized medicine or precision medicine or nano medicine. These are all buzzwords centered around the theme that one size fit all kind of therapy is not the way to go because each individual person would have their own type of micrometastasis, their own, uh, they may have stem cells in their, in their, in their tumor which needs to be treated differently. So nanotechnologies have this strengths where we can look for the behaviors of cells at cellular and subcellular scales and look for genomic and proteomic makeup of those cells which would give us a complete picture of what lies within the enemy. And knowing the enemy is the first step towards defeating the enemy. Thank you for your attention.